Megalophobia. Defined as the irrational and excessive fear of large objects that can occur as a result of a negative experience due to an unknown cause. Likely caused by somebody looking at Fizznob for the very first time. Megalophobia is something that can apply to many different things. Imposing buildings, massive ships or statues, a, a giant goddamn Spongebob, I guess, if this video's anything to go by. But, of course, a key part that makes up the fear of megalophobia are these giant things that may be more organic in nature. Creatures beyond our comprehension that could either be a threat without even knowing or use their size to their advantage to cause as much hurt, chaos, and destruction in their wake. And that would be exactly what I am interested to cover today. My dear viewer, let me introduce you to an ongoing series, one involving an animal having mutated beyond conceivable comprehension, one that doesn't seem to stop evolving until it's too late for humanity itself. Let me introduce you to the Sonic taste. Godzilla, l let me introduce you to a, a Godzilla. Th th this guy, this guy right here. Godzilla is one of those things that everyone knows, but not everyone truly comprehends the versatility of. Created as a direct response to the deadly nukings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, personified into a massive and seemingly unstoppable monster, who would go on to become an absolute cultural icon. With several sequels to that original film being made for decades to come. He'd fight other kaiju, at one point they gave him a kid and they, they went on wacky adventures together. Uh, th th this era was kind of strange, definitely not everyone's cup of tea I'd imagine, but the versatility would ultimately be Godzilla's defining strength. And in 2016, an adaptation of this character decided to go back to the fundamental roots of Godzilla a little bit more. No other monsters for Godzilla to fight, no more being seen as a symbol of balance or order, an adaptation that would completely strip back to the roots of the character, to being this incomprehensible, unstoppable force. This being Shin Godzilla. And let me tell you, it is fucking awesome. Shin Godzilla is hands down my favorite adaptation of the character. I have this big ass poster of him in my room for a reason. Everything down to the tone, the linearity of this world that Godzilla inhabits, the freaky ass design, but most importantly, the sheer hopelessness one should feel while in the presence of this beast. Shin Godzilla isn't like any other iteration of Godzilla, having the ability to rapidly evolve and mutate to the harsh surroundings given to it. These mutations being what makes it able to survive on land or be more resistant to man-made weapons like gunfire or bombs. But the thing that is the scariest about this evolving nature is the fact it doesn't really seem to have any boundaries. If left unchecked, Shin would continue to evolve even further beyond our forces to stop it, something we caught it from doing just on time at the end of the movie. However, if it was gone unchecked for too long, Shin would have become borderline unstoppable, and what he could have turned into is a thought experiment that could send shivers down anybody's spine. Now, imagine that concept, but Shin could also now run at the speed of sound. Okay, time to get into what this video is actually about. Sonic and horror have had a very strong relationship over the past decade. We, we all know the dude with the bloody eyes, the, the dude with the bloody eyes and the black shoes, whatever the fuck this thing is supposed to be. But rarely do horror concepts for Sonic branch out beyond your typical executable file shenanigans. So, on the rare occasion a piece of Sonic horror media does pop up that doesn't fall into this category, it's bound to grab mine and many others' attention. So, what if we took the terrifying, deadly, and all-consuming nature of Shin Gojira and gave it to Sonic the Hedgehog. Created by Evanimous, the Sonic Tapes is a short analog horror series consisting of six episodes at the time of writing this. The underlying concept of this creation being everything that I have been leading up to this entire time. 
What if Shin Godzilla was Sonic the Hedgehog? This concept sounds fringe and absolutely insane, and don't worry, it is. But the way that it's executed, in my personal opinion, goes leaps and bounds beyond what you'd typically expect out of the analog horror format. Creating something that absolutely shows there was a load of care and passion to make this series an absolute love letter to the source material that inspired it. The origins of Shin Sonic actually come from two sources. The first being Evan's second ever analog horror project, themed entirely around Shin Godzilla. Showing off an alternate retelling of the ending of the movie, where Japan couldn't freeze him in time, allowing this creature to evolve further, ultimately birthing the humanoid creatures from his tail that would cause havoc around the rest of the world. This video already shows Evan's extreme talent when it comes to art and animation, creating some absolutely gnarly shots that replicate the tone of the movie incredibly well, especially to all be done by one person. If you're already a fan of Evan's other works, absolutely go check this short out as it is severely underrated. The other root origin for Shin Sonic would come in the form of this drawing from Evan posted on Twitter all the way back in 2020. This creature, affectionately dubbed Sonk Hedgog, would be the main inspiration for Shin Sonic's stage one design. And despite the comedic nature of this little guy, you'll begin to see that what it would become is something not to be reckoned with. So, let's dive into the world. One that feels desolate and overpowered fundamentally. Where, if the threat that is inhabiting it isn't destroyed, it may be too late for humanity itself. This is the Sonic Tapes. The darkest Sonic series I've ever watched. Now, there's nothing more to do than press play. The first tape in the series, labeled House Footage, starts off pretty strong in the visuals department. We see Sonic to our left, with elongated features standing motionless. Next to him, what appears to be the corpse of Dr. Robotnik, most of the carnage done to him censored by two black bars. After a while, Sonic opens his eyes, and the scene transitions to an emergency alert system. The warning states that an unknown threat has been mutilating people in the area, and we are advised to lock our doors and windows, as well as arm ourselves in the threat of danger. Before switching the message to say that we should prepare for a face-to-face -face encounter with this threat. After this, we cut to many shots of a surrounding area, seemingly being caught off of cameras placed around a house. We have an outdoor view, a view of what looks like to be a front door, and a view of a staircase pointing upwards. We cut back to the outside. We can see Sonic standing behind a tree line. The noise of glass breaking is heard as we get confirmation that he is working his way inside. Sonic, now at the staircase, starts to make his way into one of the rooms. After one more cycle of the cameras, we're met with... <laughs> Our cameraman tries his best to hide with bated breath, but as a certain white hedgehog would say, it's no use. Attacking the cameraman, we get our first good glimpse at this creature as the video fades with a heartbeat. Would I be wrong to say I don't really care for this installment? Don't get me wrong, there's nothing inherently bad about it, the beginning setup is genuinely fairly chilling, and the art is really good and eerie, but this is the only installment I'd say that falls into your typical analog horror traps and tropes. Lingering on shots for too long, an abundant use of static, least spooky face. Not to say that these are inherently bad traits, but as you'll see, the series really steps up your expectations following this installment. For now, this sets up basically everything you need to know right now. Sonic is evil, he's going around eating people, and Robotnik is supposedly dead. But why is he dead exactly? Although we have a pretty good idea as to how he died, why did he die? Well, thankfully, we have a prequel. The 
The video, simply titled Sonic the Hedgehog Animation, is something I'm unsure came before or after house footage, as this video was taken off of YouTube for some time, but recently reinstated. Regardless, I do feel that although objectively being chronologically first, it works better as a prequel to the first installment. The animation starts with what looks like to be Sonk Hedgehog breathing heavily while resting beneath a tree with a case in his hand. This case is revealed to be a lunchbox, <clears throat> sorry, Lunk Bosk, and as he opens it, he pulls out a dead Flicky. This Flicky does not seem to satiate his appetite, however, as he spots another strolling down with a motobug in a strangely friendly fashion. Sonic stops them dead in his tracks, as this scene plays out. After cracking open the motobug like a peanut shell, Sonic zooms off to look for the person behind this. We cut to Robotnik, roboticizing Flickies as he typically would, but it doesn't seem to be in a malicious way. Robotnik in this universe seems to be using the robots as a way to give Flickies the ability to move after being injured. After helping a rabbit into another motobug, Sonic bursts right through the wall of Robotnik's lab, staring at him with his now iconic cold expression. After a minute, he speaks. <laughs> For a brief moment, you can see what looks like to be the remains of Robotnik's head flash on screen as we hear the sounds of helicopter noises and get a glimpse at a cave entrance. Even with all the installments we'll watch after this one, this may still hold as my favorite in the entire series. This being a fully animated piece with its general tone really makes this feel like one of those surreal, postmodern Sonic animations you would have seen on 2010's YouTube or Newgrounds. Evan clearly seems to take a lot of inspiration from artists like Sir Pello and maybe even people like OniNG or Psychic Pebbles with his work, and he captures that dark comedy style of animation perfectly. This would have absolutely freaked me out as a kid. More than that, however, this video is still very important for a myriad of reasons. First, it shows us the origin of this version of Sonic, starting off as a malnourished homunculus that seems to gain more strength as he consumes. In this universe, Robotnik is also not evil, and instead uses his machines to help animals of Sonic's world. Though, this Sonic is not happy about that and brutalizes the good doctor for tampering with his main food source, which would directly take us to the beginning of house footage. This also seems to give credence to the idea that Sonic gets bigger for every key target he consumes. Starting off the massacre against Eggman, small like in the beginning, morphing into his lankier form after. This helps us get an idea on how Shin Sonic evolves. Instead of adapting to his environment, it instead just seems to evolve through how much it can consume. The next episode is labeled as Two-Tailed Fox which gives us an idea on what to expect. We start off the episode with this absolutely disturbing looking Tails design, sleeping on what appears to be a sleeping bag. Footsteps in the dark immediately wake Tails up and reveal his big, beautiful eyes. Panning over, it's revealed that Tails is sleeping in the cave from last episode, explaining why his flight noises were being played as the episode ended. For a brief moment, we get a glimpse of Shin once again, before he scurries off into the dark once more. Tails is visibly shaken by what he saw, a fear that his predator would inevitably capitalize on.
We cut to another report stating that the missing persons reports have increased exponentially since we last checked in, stating that almost 1,000 people have gone missing in the Hilltop County area. Remember this piece of information, it'll be important in just a moment. Despite the efforts of search parties, no people have been found just yet. In fact, more people seem to have gone missing through these search efforts. After the broadcast, we are given another perspective of yet another break-in victim, but he's not working alone this time. We cut back to the report, stating that we are about to see images from a camera that belonged to one of the members of the search party. These images show sonic size has increased exponentially. We're also given further confirmation that Tails is now an accomplice through this image. Despite the hysteria being caused, the local government still will not acknowledge these creatures as the roots of the disappearances. But I have a feeling this situation might become too big to ignore. This episode continues to build on the foundations of the last, with Sonic not just killing and consuming Tails, but what other possession Sonic is undergoing, Tails has also undergone, now sharing the same sinister traits as Sonic. On top of this, Shin is now getting a lot bigger. He's gone from this lanky and slender figure to a downright beast at the end of this episode. And by the looks of things, it's only going to become more of a threat if this diagram is to go off of anything. The other very notable thing about this episode is the mention of a Hilltop County being a clear nod to Hilltop Zone from Sonic 2. I don't know about you, but I feel that this cements the fact that this doesn't take place in our reality, but rather the Sonic universe itself. Unlike a lot of media like this that'll have the games invade the real world, the real world in this continuity just seems to be Sonic's actual world. Which, may I add, is is another really refreshing thing about this series. It's cool to see horror done inside of Sonic's world from time to time, and as we'll start to see, the fact that it's actually set in Sonic's world will continue to prove itself useful to uncovering the overarching narrative and story. We're about at the halfway point of Shin's story up until now, and if things keep going in the trajectory that they are, I believe things may start to get a hell of a lot more bleak. Episode 4 opens with that familiar report structure stating that a police officer was called to patrol the area near the edge of Hilltop Forest. A very crucial thing listed here is the time frame of all of this happening, putting the events of this story around November of 2006. I guess this is the second scariest Sonic thing to happen around that time. We're given the details that what we are about to see next is the recovered footage of the officer's body cam, and we transition into real footage. The patrol officer is pictured getting out of his vehicle and walking deep into the dark forest. After his radio goes out, he hears a noise coming from the tree lines, and we're given one of my favorite shots in the series so far. The officer tries its best to run away from the beast, its cries being able to be heard all throughout the forest. But, as we know, this creature doesn't just work alone anymore. Attempting to run further from the squad, the officer stumbles upon a very unique visual. A statue of a bull with a foreign language engraved into it. The officer focuses onto the engravings before zooming out again for his attention would be caught by something else. 
Somehow the officer is able to slip away again. I guess Shin really just felt like playing with his food this time around. But it doesn't really matter as we get one more scene of him running away before we are brought back to our report stating the officer's body was found placed by that same shrine insides completely removed and severely decomposed, despite only being missing for less than 24 hours. We're given the reveal of what this looked like, even if it is censored, honing in on the fact that he looked decomposed once more. The situation is only now starting to become too big to ignore, and the public is now being told to evacuate high activity areas. The video ends with one final shot. Hey, so is it safe to say we're f now? Out of all the episodes we've watched up until this point, this one definitely shows us the most vague images we need to analyze. What's up with that statue? Why is Tails now able to multiply? How the hell did this guy run away from Sonic twice? Although I don't have an answer for that last one other than Shin just simply being sadistic for the sake of being sadistic. The other things I believe have a bit more of a concrete explanation, even if it's it's not clear on the surface. First, with Tails. The explanation here, I believe, is as simple as Tails now just having a similar byproduct of power Sonic does. Instead of growing larger as it consumes, it seems to instead multiply. Whether these beasts are also under control by Shin or have their own free will is still unknown. The Bull statue is not only a more important detail, but possibly the most important piece to putting together this puzzle. At first, the inclusion of this statue seems to be very random and out of place with everything else we've seen of this world so far. But when you take a closer look, everything starts to click. First, the words that are engraved into the statue. I wouldn't blame you if you aren't really able to tell what this is. It took me a while to figure this out myself. But the text engraved into this statue is actually the Hebrew word melech. If we translate this word to English, we're given the word king. The word king or melek in Hebrew culture is significant for a myriad of things. From being used as a way of describing the kings of Israel in the Hebrew Bible, to being conventionally used as a name in more modern times. Though, the thing we want to focus on is the final common use for the word melek. That being for the Hebrew deity, Moloch. A deity known for child sacrifice. In most interpretations of Hebrew and Christian theology, the symbol of Moloch is seen to be one of evil and of unethical sacrificial practices. Showing up in both Leviticus 18.21 and Leviticus 22-5, both in the context of being condemned and that the worship of this deity would even result in punishment. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed to set them apart to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Moreover, thou shalt not say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I also will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given his seed unto Moloch, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. And if people of the land do at all hide their eyes from that man, when he giveth his seed unto Moloch, and put him not to death, then I will set my face against that man, and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go astray after him, to go astray after Moloch, from among their people. The statue seen at the end of Cry of the Forest is undeniably meant to be that of Moloch, given all of this information. But in this interpretation of the deity, instead of it being specifically children needed to sacrifice for it to be satisfied, it seems to be anything that it can directly consume to gain more power. 
Malak isn't traditionally interpreted to possess people, but many works of fiction do give him this trait, such as the TV series Sleepy Hollow, where he also has the ability to turn people into his own demonic minions. Sound familiar? But the most damning piece of evidence behind this creature being Moloch actually comes from none other than Sir Pelo's Spooky Month series. Given the fact that Evan's work seems to be heavily inspired by Sir Pelo and other Newgrounds animators, I wouldn't find it hard to believe that this genuinely serves as the direct inspiration as to why Moloch is the spirit that seems to possess the vessel of Sonic the Hedgehog. So, we seem to have a motive now. This creature, taking the twisted form of Sonic the Hedgehog, is actually an ancient deity, consuming everything he can in order to gain more power. And, if that ending shot is to go by, humanity as we know it may be doomed. A Dreadful Vision is the second-to-last installment for now, and starts in a very unconventional way for the series so far, with in-game footage of Knuckles running down Green Hill Zone, monologuing to himself about how empty everything feels. After a while of running, he stumbles across a destroyed Badnik, along with what appears to be a dead Flicky next to it. Cutting perspectives to Knuckles' expression, still done in pixel art to fit with the theming. He presses onwards and encounters Tails at the top of a hill. He calls out to Tails, asking to know what is going on here, but to no response. After being faked out, Knuckles now needs to do everything in his power to escape from Shin, just barely outrunning him as a distorted version of the drowning theme plays in the background. But as he starts to gain more distance, something dreadful happens. Knuckles, now trapped, attempts to plead with the creature, stating that it can't be Sonic. Sonic would never do this. After asking Shin what his motive truly is, this is his response. In the garbled mess, we are able to make out many scenes from previous episodes, a sketch of Moloch, and even an old painting of him, officially cementing Shin's undeniable connection to this deity. At the end of this montage, we see Shin's newest form rise once more. A bright light starts to shower over Knuckles, as angelic music plays in the background. Knuckles asks what this is, as a visual of the seven super emeralds appears to us on screen. An unknown voice speaks out to Knuckles to seek them out, as they are our only hope. Shin needs the chaos emeralds for its ritual and the voice lets Knuckles know to not let it complete that ritual. After Knuckles asks the question of what would happen if Shin does, the voice finds it appropriate to simply show him. <laughs> Mm. 
Knuckles, with a determined look in his eye, sets off to complete his task and stop Sonic. Or rather, Moloch. Out of all the episodes in the series up until this point, I believe this to be the most important one. Everything that has been set up so far has led to this moment. We now have a clear protagonist to follow, and confirmation of ideas set up in previous installments. It is now no debate that Moloch is in fact the one possessing the vessel of Sonic the Hedgehog. The vision sequence gives us direct confirmation of that, as well as some other notable details. For a brief moment, like literally a frame, you can see something flash at the bottom right corner. Blue text on an orange backdrop, reading, help us. I think there's really only one thing you can interpret from this, and that's the spirits of the real Sonic and Tails are still out there, but have such little power or control this message seems to be the only thing they could muster. The entity talking to Knuckles at the end about the Super Emeralds is something that's still left ambiguous. But whatever it is, it confirms that out there still exists a powerful force of good, and is able to give Knuckles the motivation to hopefully take out this abominable beast. Hopefully, before it's too late. You know, I feel like it'd be helpful if Knuckles, like, recruited Shadow or, like, Blaze, maybe. What, what the fuck is everyone else doing, actually? Move on to the final episode in the series so far, simply titled Chaos. The video starts with the silhouette of Knuckles passing a sign reading Palm Tree Panic, the starting zone of Sonic CD. We cut to another shot of one of the past goals from that game, broken on the floor. After Knuckles discovers this destroyed sign, we cut to the old, reliable report system, revealing that these reports have actually been from Gun this entire time, meaning this version of the continuity has to take place in the modern continuity. The report reveals that Sonic has become too large and powerful to keep hidden from the public, and the Tails copies are spreading out even further. Gun reveals this threat has gone beyond being domestic. Domestic. And if it isn't stopped soon, Sonic will become a global threat. And after this, a question that you may have had on your mind is finally revealed to us. Sonic, in fact, has maintained his speed despite his now asinine size. We cut to a shot of Shin's newest form from a bird's eye perspective, the framing making this look like it's straight out of Evangelion, which was likely intentional considering Shin Godzilla was also directed by Hideki Anno. We see Sonic look up to the helicopter that is filming him as he blasts off at incredible speeds. Due to the sheer size of this beast, this action causes the frequency to disconnect, revealing that Sonic was able to clear a several hundred mile distance between Hilltop County and Station Square in mere seconds, creating a devastating shockwave in its path. Despite this, Shin Sonic doesn't seem to have any interest in actually attacking Station Square, and instead was there to search for something, letting out a deathly cry afterwards. We see Sonic consume the green Chaos Emerald and disappear in the blink of an eye in the process, likely sending a wave of destruction throughout Station Square in its wake. Knuckles enters back into the picture of things, teaming up with Gun to give them more information about the Super Emeralds, stating that Gun should continue working to prevent Sonic from gathering more Chaos Emeralds while Knuckles goes to gather the Super Emeralds. Emeralds. And with the death of Robotnik, this seems to be the only course of action Gun may have left. Shin's danger is exemplified to us once again, as well as Tails' kidnappings now becoming more than just a nationwide issue. After this, we're given likely the most iconic line 
in the entire series. We cut back to Knuckles with a restored past goalpost. Knuckles, we're good to go. And that's the Shin Sonic tapes, for now at least, is what I thought until today exactly. After a three month hiatus, just as I was finishing up this video, the latest drop in the Sonic tapes had just come out. And you'll start to see exactly why this took a whole three months to finish. If you've gotten used to or comfortable with all the things shown in the series so far, you haven't seen anything yet. The episode starts off right where the last ended with Knuckles traveling to the past. While he begins to process, we see a glimpse back to his vision, and he remembers what is truly at stake. The scene cuts as we see Knuckles arrive at his destination, the camera panning out to reveal that we are at Angel Island 3,000 years in the past. Oh yeah, this entire episode is animated like this, by the way. What the fuck? Knuckles starts to glide his way towards Angel Island, landing in a ditch of rubble before going any further. For a brief second, we see a glimpse of Shin attack Knuckles' mind, causing him to stagger for a moment, before staring down an entryway. Cutting to an older-looking echidna, Knuckles slowly approaches, revealing we are at the Temple of the Super Emeralds. Knuckles makes his way to the top, being immediately halted by the other echidna. You know you're not supposed to be here. Why aren't you back with the rest of the clan? Come to think of it, I don't think I've seen you before. State your name and your business here. My name is Knuckles the Echidna. I am not of this land. I come in dire need of the Emerald's power. This other echidna is not having it though and starts to absolutely body Knuckles, throwing him through a wall before slamming him to the ground. But Knuckles, knowing what's at stake, doesn't let this shake him, punching the old guardian straight into a wall. If you won't give them to me, then I'll have to take them! <sighs> Holy shit is that- The episode freezes just as we are about to get into the full fight but it's not entirely over just yet. As we cut to somewhere else, droning music is heard in the background. We cut to an environment that looks to be made of flesh, as the same Moloch statue is seen right in the center, now with four of the seven Chaos Emeralds. Okay, so, Evan, what the fuck? This series is awesome, dude. Everything about its structure just speaks to me on a personal level. I can't really think of a more creative non-EXE horror project like this that has been at this level of quality, despite clearly still paying slight homage to EXE tropes. Such as the slowed-down version of the Kefka laugh heard throughout the entire series, as well as iconic EXE set pieces being reimagined for this character. I had my closing thoughts completely written and thought out before that latest episode had released, but everything I had to say got completely altered at the release of this episode. It's not every day you see the analog horror to the second coming of Nazo Unleashed Pipeline, but hey, there's a first for everything, I guess. Seeing the improvement from here to house footage has been an absolute treat to behold. This episode isn't even analog or digital horror anymore. 
anymore. This is straight up just a fan-made Sonic anime with slight horror themings. The art here has such a simple style to it, but it works so well in its favor. The only thing I can really say I wish to see improved is the voice acting, as the audio on both of the VAs here sounds a little stunted and not mixed that well. If you won't give them to me, then I'll have to take them. Like, this doesn't sound like Knuckles is yelling a declaration to fight. It sounds more like he's mad that he won't be given his free sample at Costco. I don't know. Maybe it's intentional, since it aligns with the masterful mixing of the adventure games. Regardless, undeniably the best best installment in the entire series. If this is the direction Evan is going to continue taking things, then I am absolutely willing to wait months for another three minute installment if it means that by the end of things, we'll have what's shaping up to be one of the best fan-made Sonic projects made this decade. And with this episode being titled as Past One, I feel like this is meant to be the start of a new arc for this series. As for what's next, well, it's anyone's guess now. The Sonic Tapes is a series I believe has more than proved its worth in the months it has progressed. It is the absolute definition of having two special interests and way too much talent, and I couldn't be happier that Evan is seeing the fruits of his labor. This video even managed to get on trending at the time of writing this. Bravo, Evan, you have made cinema. Shin Sonic is a series that seems to evolve just as rapidly as its main monster, and if you're introduction to this character was through content farms or shit posts. hopefully this video was able to spike your interest to fully support this project. With all these eyes on him now, I believe Evan is only going to get more busy as the months go by. So, who knows? Maybe I'll revisit this topic again some other time. Maybe I'll talk about the horror skunks animation in the future. It's anyone's guess. Thank you to my patrons, Funky Izzy, Davian McEwen, Aaron Parsons, Lotus Flower, James Bond fan, Rick Hort 12, Reverted Lotus, Pigpen, D for DJ, It's Juicy, Jacer, Just Sam, Dusky, and Squeaks de Corge. I've been Dags, and until next time... May God help us all. I'm just kidding, see ya.